You're all so orderly. Look, four o'clock hit and everybody went silent. It's beautiful. <laughs> um, so welcome everyone to the 42nd Annual Archives Lecture. Um, as we begin, I would like us all to acknowledge that the Queens is situated on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee. I'm personally grateful to be able to live here as an uninvited guest alongside the beautiful waters and for all of us to come together this afternoon um, to gain and exchange knowledge um, here on this land. Uh, to acknowledge this traditional territory is to recognize its longer history, uh, one predating the establishment of the earliest European colonies or records thereof, seeing as this is a archives lecture. Um, it is also to acknowledge this territory's significance for the indigenous people who lived and continue to live upon it and whose practices and spiritualities uh, were tied to the land and continue to develop in relation to the territory and to the other inhabitants here today. So our speaker for today is the wonderful Stephen Maynard. Um, Stephen is an adjunct associate professor here at Queens and uh, where he's been teaching, researching and writing the history of sexuality and queer history in particular for many years now. Uh, he was uh, the founder in 1996 uh, and is the ongoing co-chair of the Canadian Committee on the History of Sexuality, an affiliated committee uh, of the Canadian Historical Association. Uh, Stephen teaches a senior seminar, Thinking Inside the Box, Archives, Politics, and the Past, uh, among other courses, but they're not as important because they are not, you know, they don't have archives in the title, but he does a lot of other stuff, uh, teaches a lot of other things. Um, so in addition to teaching and using archives, Stephen also writes about them. Uh, I was first introduced to Stephen actually at the, uh, when he attended the Association of Canadian Archivists um, Awards Lunch in 2010, where he received the uh, Archivaria's W.K. Lamb Award, which is um, awarded for the article that uh, most advances archival thinking in Canada. Uh, as the current editor of that journal now, which I was not then, I can tell you that this is the senior award of the journal, and it's not often that the award goes to a sort of non-archival educator or practitioner. So Stephen, while a historian, has always been a sort of honorary archivist in my eyes. Um, more recently, Stephen has published in the journal Public, uh, in the special issue Devotion, Today's Future Becomes Tomorrow's Archive, uh, and the article titled uh, Queer uh, Parisiast, uh, a study of the personal archives of Alex Wilson, a gay left activist intellectual in Toronto in the 1970s and 80s. Wilson interviewed uh, Foucault during the latter's visit to Toronto in, the in 1982, and Stephen's article uh, includes a reproduction, archives again, uh, of Wilson's marked up uh, manuscript um, of the interview with Foucault uh, that was found in Wilson's papers. So we are, you're upholding your title of honorary archivist by always exploring those depths. Um, the article on Wilson is an early version of a book chapter, actually, that will be um, coming out about Foucault's trips to Canada and Quebec and his influence on activist intellectuals here in Canada. Uh, and when not immersed in the archives or with his nose stuck in a Foucault book, Stephen has been active in our local community in the LGBTQ movement and with a lot of that activism taking place here in Kingston and at Queen's during the late 80s and 90s. So let's welcome Stephen and dive into an adventure in fairyland, uh, searching for sexual and gender nonconformity at Queen's in the University Archives. Welcome, Stephen. In April of 1932, the Toronto tabloid Hush declared this. There is something radically wrong at Queen's University. <laughs> the Hush story involved Miss K, K-A-Y, a Queen's student in her second year. Miss K planned to pass the Easter recess in Toronto, and so on the morning of Good Friday, boarded a train at Kingston Station. Mindful of the holiday and that she was headed to the big city, Miss K dressed for the occasion. 
According to Hush, she was a chic little figure in a chocolate brown ensemble with matching collar of expensive fox fur. Oh, I'm just realizing I, my thing isn't, oh, now it really is. Sorry. It's not doing, <laughs> it's not showing on my thing, so I can't see what's happening. I can, yes, thanks. <laughs> On her arrival uh, in Toronto, Miss K tried to get a room at Elm House, which was the YWCA residence, but it was full. She then headed to the Ford Hotel at Bay and Dundas. A bellboy greeted Miss K and carried what he described as the charming young lady's bag to the check-in desk. Once installed in her room, Miss K unpacked her things, including, again according to Hush, Numerous articles of ladies' wear, a negligee, silk pajamas. On the dresser were cosmetics, perfumes, and other adjuncts of the female toilette. After fixing her hair and freshening her makeup, Miss K hit the streets. She did not get very far up Bay Street, however, before she was stopped by two plainclothes police officers. Turns out the Ford Hotel's house detective thought that there was something suspicious about Miss K and alerted the police. They escorted Miss K to the Dundas Street Police Station. Here's how the Toronto Star described the scene as Miss K entered the holding cells. High-heeled, rouged cheeks, wavy blonde hair, Jean Harlow couldn't have created more furor. Inmates, they hurriedly um, rose from their sleeping positions, uh, tried to like rearrange, adjust their clothes into some semblance of order. This is still the, the tabloid. Until the police escort said, be yourself, boys. It's just a guy in women's clothes. Yes, K was really Keith. Or as the Globe and Mail dubbed him, the fashion queen from Queens. <laughs> Sorry, I can't. All right, I want to pause um, here for a moment to thank the gang at the Queen's Archives. Ken, Jeremy, Heather, Deidre, and no doubt others uh, for the invitation to give this lecture. It is a real honor, of course, um, and especially meaningful one for me because it represents the culmination of working almost every year, sometimes twice a year, for at least the past 15 years with the archives and using the records of the archives to develop student projects um, on everything from the 19th century Kingston Penitentiary and Rockwood Asylum to the 1989 No Means No campaign. And here I must single out Heather Holm. Uh, she's the person that I have worked with the most closely over the years. Never once has Heather betrayed even a hint of fatigue when she sees me coming with yet another one of my overly detailed course projects. On the contrary, Heather always dives right in, digging up sources and providing enthusiastic Archives 101 classes for countless students. My work on Keith is, it's been no exception. When I first um, started trying to track Keith down, I asked Heather if I could see Keith's official student record. Heather returned from the vault with a, you're gonna wanna see this look on her face. <laughs> but, ever the principled archivist, she couldn't show me. Personal information on university records or in university records is covered by the Protection of Privacy Act. But surely she would show me. I was like, Heather, come on, it's me. Nope. Not unless I could prove that Keith had been deceased for at least 30 years. I couldn't back then, but I can now. I also see um, here today friends uh, and colleagues from the history department, from special collections, uh, and um, a number of other places. And I also see students, grad students uh, and undergrad students from my first year Canadian history class and from my archives seminar. And I want to thank you all for coming this afternoon. It really means a lot to me to see all of you here. So what happened with Keith? What had he done? 
police charged Keith with vagrancy, a catch-all category that criminalized any immorality or indecency in any street or public place. In court, the police explained that the charge against Keith was for masquerading as a woman. Now, this was not simply colloquial language. In many cities, indecency bylaws enforced the gender binary, explicitly making illegal the masquerading as a person of the opposite sex, to quote the law's narrow, dualistic take on gender. Uh, Kingston had one of these um, bylaws, section uh, 13, section 13 of bylaw number 26 from 1907. Toronto had a similar bylaw, and these um, anti-masquerading uh, bylaws were used against trans people, sex workers, and gay men right up until the 1960s. It wasn't until I linked Keith's court record to newspaper accounts that the Queen's connection actually became clear to me, abundantly clear, as it turns out. In an irresistible example of the thing Queen's most dreads, bad publicity, <laughs> the scandal of Queen's fashion plate was splashed across newspapers all over Ontario. Toronto, Ottawa, Windsor, Owen Sound, Hamilton, Cornwall, Sault Ste. Marie, Niagara Falls, and of course, Kingston. Papers from Montreal to Victoria and Vancouver picked up the story. And papers in um, Saskatoon, Edmonton, Regina paid particular attention. Keith was from Regina, where, as one paper explained, his father was a prominent Western provincial government official. In fact, he was a lawyer in the Saskatchewan Attorney General's office. For six weeks between the end of March and early May 1932, more than 35 often front page stories kept Keith and Queens in the national news. As late as June and as far away as Florida, Keith continued to make waves. The Sarasota Herald ran a front page story on the audacious behavior of a smartly clad young girl, freshman at Queen's University. All right, I'm not entirely certain um, what you might all be expecting um, from this lecture from me, but let me put um, your minds at ease. There will be no Foucault. <laughs> no Foucault on the archive as the rule governing all that is sayable in the culture. No Derrida and his mal d'archive. No archive as the manifestation of the death drive. <laughs> we'll save that for the seminar room. Today, some stories from the archives. Given Keith's connection to the university, he naturally led me um, to the Queen's archives and into university records. The records of the principal's office, the Arts Society, the Board of Study, the Faculty of Medicine, uh, student handbooks, and much else. Digging through Queen's archives records for Keith opened up what for me was an unexpected, um, rich and broader history of sexual and gender transgression at Queen's. And I wanna share some highlights from that um, work, that research with you this afternoon. I should say that this research has never been an actual um, focused project of mine. Um, I've done it in fits and starts over the years, uh, not with a publication in mind, but mainly for lectures that I give in my courses, particularly the history of sexuality in Canada course that I teach. As faculty, we often talk about the ideal relationship that should exist between our research and teaching. Were it not for the Queen's archives, this would remain more platitude than practice in my own pedagogy. One of my aims in doing this work has always been to find ways to speak to students for whom the history of gender and sexual dissidents might hold some personal meaning. Those meanings change in relation to shifting contexts. And so in returning to this material um, today, one of the things that struck me was how elements of Keith's story that I had never actually paid too much attention to before kind of bubbled to the surface um, and which, as I hope to show, speak to our present moment um, on campus. Before returning to Keith, I want to make a couple other points about researching the history of sexuality in the Queen's archives, because I think it helps get at what are some of the unique features um, about our university archives. 
Um, as many of you know, I suspect the Queen's Archives maintains more than university uh, records. It is also the keeper of the historical records of the city of Kingston. In my own non-Keith-related research, for example, I have used the historical records of the Kingston uh, police. Uh, this would be an example of that, um, a police court record of convictions found in the archives. Uh, in this volume from 1878 to 1892, I found the case of Thomas Cranham, a 23-year-old stonecutter found guilty of buggery in March 1889 and sentenced to 10 years in Kingston Penitentiary. Now, a different volume of this same series of ledgers was used by Maggie Ross, who's a PhD candidate in the Department of History, for her research on the history of um, women and sex work uh, in, in Kingston. Now, when she um, consulted this document, she did so at the Kingston Police Headquarters. That's where it was found. It was difficult to locate, it took considerable time to find, and even longer to get access to. Police headquarters in Kingston, as elsewhere, does not actually have an archive, nor do they operate as an archive. And then yet a third volume of this series of ledgers was in the possession of cultural services, um, the city of Kingston, also unavailable to researchers. But through the combined lobbying efforts of Maggie, myself, and Heather, over a period of years, these three dispersed volumes were brought together and deposited in the Queen's archives, the last one joining its companions in 2022. This now represents one of the most complete runs of police court records that I know of in Ontario because many of those lower court um, records were lost or, or destroyed. But the reason I'm really telling you um, this little story is that in my experience, the Queen's archives treats researchers not simply as passive users of, of the archives, but as potential collaborators. Um, all of us working together in the interests of historical preservation um, and public access. To take a different example, we might consider the archives LGBTQ collection. In 2011, two Kingston residents, Janice McAlpine and Renee Van Waring, proposed that they work with the archives to establish and develop a collection of materials pertaining to Kingston's LGBTQ history. And so, here we have the Queen's Archives helping to facilitate and continuing to help facilitate a community archives. When Kingston itself, I think, lacks the resources and the infrastructure to maintain a freestanding community-based archive of the kind that you can find in Toronto um, or Montreal. So in my archive seminar, we've spent a lot of time, and I see some of you out there, so you'll, this will ring true, I hope. We spent a lot of time discussing the differences between community and institutional archives. The Queen's Archives, I would argue, blurs that distinction uh, in really productive ways. Okay, back to Keith. After spending a night in jail, Keith appeared in Toronto Police Court. He told the court that it was all a big misunderstanding. Dressing up and walking the streets as a woman was a means of creating some excitement. In its first story on the case, entitled Queen's Student Has Lost a Bet, Kingston's Whig Standard explained that Keith had bet several other students that he could go to Toronto dressed as a woman and not be found out. I realize I have been very foolish, Keith admitted. The police magistrate ordered Keith to be detained pending an investigation. So as Keith chilled out in his jail cell for the next four days and four nights, the police and the press began their inquiries. The Toronto Star contacted Dr. Hamilton Fife, the principal of Queen's University. About the student who'd been arrested dressed as a girl in Toronto last night, the principal said, I'm certainly not in favor of it. He must have been one of our co-eds. <laughs> if this boy is really a Queen's student, will there be an investigation, the reporter asked. Yes, a full inquiry, promised Dr. Fife. The reporter also spoke to Miss Alice King, the university registrar, who was certain that the boyish blonde was not a Queen's man. We have no Keith M. registered here. 
Now, the register was contradicted by the Whig standard, which, with the advantage of local resources at its disposal, simply looked in the 1931-32 edition of the Queen's Student Directory and quickly found Keith's name. <laughs> Looking at those same directories in the archives, we learned that in 1931-32, Keith lived at 135 Union Street on the corner of Alfred, which is just like a stone's throw from where we are um, right now while the previous year he lived just a few blocks up in this house at 177, Alfred. And, uh, okay, I was just gonna say, every time I s someone raises there, you live there. So Keith lived in your, in your house. This always happens. <laughs> I love those kind of details, but the truth is, of course, they don't tell us too much about why Keith did what he did. One of the Toronto papers wondered if, he might, if it might have been a fraternity prank. But Miss King explained, the masquerade could not be the result of a fraternity initiation prank. We have no fraternities at Queen's. They were banned ages ago. Another reporter um, wondered whether, this is, how, this is how he put it, whether this was about, and I'm quoting, winning a wager with other Queen's University students who are interested in sex diversification in relation to their art and literary studies, unquote. <laughs> now this is an intriguing notion, or at least it is to me, especially given that it won't be for another 70 years that Queens establishes a sexual and gender diversity certificate <laughs> program. Maybe this was like an early <laughs> moment in that, I don't know. It's also the least plausible of Keith's explanations, for he wasn't exactly what you'd call studious. Keith began first year arts at Queens in September of 1930. A document called the Report of December Examinations, this is in the archives, reveals that Keith passed history and economics, however he failed his other three exams. As for the second term, the minutes of the Board of Study include Keith's name among those who wrote no papers in April and did not present reasons. Keith's student record, confirms this, and it does so with this notation DNW, or did not write, under the April column, the April exams column. And he was advised to withdraw and loses his year. Sad, but not to worry. If you flunk out of first year arts at Queens, you can always get into med school. <laughs> The following year of 1931-32, Keith began his first year in the Faculty of Medicine at Queens. <laughs> Keith was back in court on, appropriately enough, April Fool's Day. <laughs> this time, he had a lawyer who argued that the whole thing was a prank. Police Magistrate Tinker accepted the argument, noting that Keith was from a good family and a, habit a habitual perpetrator of pranks. The charge was withdrawn, but not before the magistrate gave Keith a serious reprimand. If he hasn't been taught a lesson now, nothing will teach him. You don't want to be doing any more of this funny stuff. Don't make the mistake again. Not all the press was prepared to pass this off as a harmless prank. Noting that Keith's lawyer pleaded that the whole thing was just a university rag, Hush, the tabloid, concluded, these kinds of rags do not reflect credit on any university, and they cast a lurid light on what lies within the minds of some of our present day students. So what did Hush exactly imagine was going on in the minds of some students? Unlike the mainstream press, which kept most of its um, attention focused on, you know, the, the silly antics of university students, the tabloid fingered Keith for what it called a pansy suspect. And it titled its story on Keith, an adventure in fairyland. So pansy and fairy were early 20th century names for men who adopted modes of conventionally feminine uh, gender presentation, right? And this was um, a cultural strategy. It was a brave way for some men to boldly declare their presence on hostile streets. I should say that while gay historians first brought pansies and fairies to our attention in the early 90s, I'm thinking of um, people like George Chauncey in his book, Gay New York. More recently, those working in transgender history have asked, given the centrality of gender transgression and the 
absence of reference to overt sexuality in representations of pansies and fairies, whether they might more properly be um, belong, I guess, under the purview of trans history rather than the history of sexuality or gay history. And uh, historians like Chauncey indeed have revised their interpretation recently um, precisely along these lines. Pansy boys and fairies were a favorite topic of the tabloid press in the early 20th century. Their reports reflect the way that pansies and fairies had really become um, a, a, a fixture in urban life, modern urban life, um, in this period, so much so that they um, merited caricature uh, in the tabloid press. And here are a couple of pansy boys here. A typical tabloid report, this one from 1930, explained that these boys are prone to lipstick, rouge, delicate perfumes, and extreme cuts in clothes, and their effeminate walk, mannerisms, and voice make the identification of a true pansy quite easy. They are usually very artistic in temperament, and among them will be found clever musicians, gifted artists, and brilliant writers. So two years later then, when Keith gets up to what he's up to, he likely didn't do himself any favors when he told Hush, I worship all things artistic. In fact, there's no form of art that I do not love. I have often thought that I would like to be a musician. I have the hands of a natural violinist. The tabloid report also singled out Toronto's prominent businessmen and warned them, keep these creatures out of your automobiles and private offices. So was it just a coincidence that Keith chose to stay at the Ford, a Bay Street hotel with a lavender reputation in close proximity to the businessmen the tabloids believed to be irresistibly drawn to the pansy boys? As Keith told Hush, one swell fellow who said he was a broker wanted to take me to his office on Bay Street for a drink. Another wanted me to go to his apartment for a cocktail and lunch, but I wasn't accepting any invitations. I just wanted to win my bet fairly and get home. Didn't you realize that doing what you did might cause you to be much misunderstood? I do now, the police, uh, the poli the police after what the police told me, after having all these queer men try to flirt with me. Some were quite disgusting. I shall never play such a prank again. So, prankster or pansy? <laughs> it's never been um, my goal to play pin the pansy on Keith <laughs> or, or on any other um, historical actor. Such an identitarian impulse is not how I approach the sexual past. I will admit, though, to puzzling a little bit over Keith's bet. If it had been made on the spur of the moment, as I think most bets are, then assumedly Keith would have had to like, assemble his costume um, rather quickly, perhaps borrowing items from, uh, from female friends in Kingston. And yet the police discovered that Keith had procured the clothing in his hometown of Regina. So here's the question. Does a guy keep a complete set of women's clothes, including ladies' silk pajamas and other lingerie, and pack them when leaving home to go to university in another province, all on the off chance you'll someday have to make a bet that involves <laughs> passing as a woman. <laughs> One of the newspapers prompted from Keith an admission that I think puts a slightly different spin on things. I wanted to show my friends at Queens that I really am a man, Keith told the reporter. Ever since a group of them took me to Detroit and we went to a party where there were many girls and I ran out, I have been tormented. Then they bet me I couldn't go to Toronto dressed like a girl. I did it to prove that I am a man. The paper went on to note that Keith admitted he was bashful of girls. He did not like their company and avoided them whenever possible. <laughs> what university officials and fellow students thought about Keith's escapades is difficult to determine. If Principal Fife conducted that inquiry, I have not been able to find it in the archival records of the um, principal's office. And luckily for Keith, but unfortunately for us, the Queen's Journal finished publishing for the year in mid-March, two weeks before Keith uh, made his trip to Toronto. So we don't have any account there. We can, however, I think, reconstruct something of the broader context in which Keith's story uh, unfolded. And there are a number of layers um, to this context. First, 
Keith had really picked the wrong time to pose as a pansy, for this was, after all, uh, the Great Depression. Reading the principal's reports for the 1930s, one theme emerges clearly, the necessity to avoid frivolousness, and that's the word that keeps coming up, the necessity to avoid frivolousness on the part of both students and administration. So looking after the latter, administration, was Dr. W. E. McNeil, described by one colleague at the time as a dull and uninspiring teacher. McNeil suffered the fitting fate of most dull and uninspiring professors. He was moved into administration. <laughs> After decades as university registrar and treasurer, McNeil became vice principal under Fife in 1930, and he steered Queens through most of the Depression with what has been described as rigid economy. Despite the real precarity that the economic crisis generated, compounded by the decreasing provincial grant to the university over the course of the 1930s, McNeil was nevertheless determined that interest from the Queen's Endowment Fund would not be touched for operating costs or capital expenditures. To protect Queen's capital, and that was his mission, McNeil insulated the endowment by creating around it a complex series of reserve and contingency funds. Because these funds were maintained from existing revenue, their effect was to reduce further still the sums of money that were available for operating costs. In addition, McNeil raised student tuition fees every year. And while professor salaries were not reduced, he did embark on a rigorous reduction of part-time teaching, lab, and library assistants. He centralized control in his office, allowing no university expenditures, right down, and I'm serious, right down to paper clips and envelopes without his prior approval. He canceled popular, uh, popular programs, such as the Queen's History Summer School at the Dominion Archives, and he reduced the rate for tutors marking essays to 20 cents a paper. Such measures came at a cost, as they always do. By the mid-1930s, even the chancellor wondered publicly whether McNeil's single-minded goal of balanced budgets might not be endangering the quality of education through excessive financial rigidity. Principal Fife spoke of McNeil's economies running almost to the point of peril. Is any of this starting to sound familiar? <laughs> In such times of austerities, commentators noted a new seriousness among students and a desire for a plainer kind of living in contrast to the supposed excesses of the previous decade. One dean suggested that the economic depression encouraged among students a real determination uh, to you know, apply themselves to their studies, something seen in increased cramming for examinations. Clearly, our Keith bucked that particular <laughs> trend. <laughs> But the 1930s were not all uh, noses to the grindstone. Dances and the frolic, which was uh, uh, an annual musical review, uh, continued on, if somewhat uh, less elaborately. At other Canadian universities, these musical reviews um, often involved uh, cross-dressing, as they did uh, in Keith's home province uh, in the early 1930s. Speaking of the stage, one journalist asked Keith, did you ever consider going on the vaudeville stage as a female impersonator? How strange you should ask me that. <laughs> I have always wanted to go on the stage, and an actor once told me I had the necessary feminine touch to make quite a success. The reference to female impersonation is another layer of the context here that I don't have time to, um, to go into, other than to say that uh, in, in research on the cultural history of early 20th century um, Kingston, uh, Gord Duick has revealed how it, uh, female impersonation was um, a really popular form of entertainment on Kingston's stages, suggesting one possible um, frame through which Kingstonians might have understood reports of Keith's performance. The Depression encouraged, if not exactly um, a clampdown on, then certainly a frowning upon student frivolity. And the decade witnessed a greater role played by student government bodies in regulating other students. The Art Society, known after 1959 as ACES, convened something that it called the Arts Concursus, 
The concursus functioned um, like a court. It had um, the power to charge students with offenses, uh, and if they were found uh, guilty, then they um, meted out punishments. Looking at the minutes of the concursus, and I should say I was actually alerted to these um, records first by uh, a student in one of my classes who saw them in the ACES house before they were transferred um, over to uh, the archives. We learned that um, it punished, the concursus punished students for things like smoking uh, and shooting craps in the arts club room. Indeed, much of the activity of the Arts Society men revolved around the Student Memorial Union. Um, not, yes, there's a picture of it there. And you know, obviously today we, this is the JDUC, right? So it was purchased by Queens in 1927, but only opened in December of 1928 after considerable renovation delays. <laughs> it was essentially a men's club. Even though women had been attending Queens since the 1870s, they were not permitted to enter the student union building until the mid-1950s, and then only parts of it. And in fact, membership in the Arts Society, ASIS, was restricted to men only. Women would not be allowed to join until the 1960s. Many of the infractions dealt with by the arts concursus fell under the rubric of what it called action unbecoming of a gentleman. Accordingly, much of the court's attention focused on gender or masculinity, especially in relation to clothing and the body. Men were required to wear a jacket or vest and tie, while uh, freshmen also had to wear a queen's tam uh, and ribbon. This is like when they're going to class, I mean. As one historian of university life in Canada during the 1930s has explained, men were expected to be well-dressed but not flashy. A Queen's YMCA student handbook. I've got one right here. They look just like this. Little kind of pocket-sized, handy little pocket-sized. They remind me to give this to the archives. So. <laughs> you're actually, you're actually, you're actually, no, it didn't come from there. I, I, I got it. <laughs> A friend gave it to me. But you are actually missing this very year. Okay. Yep, yep, there you go. This YMC student handbook described the, not this one, but uh, one from this period, um, the, um, the, the model of middle class masculinity that they were after. Queen's men, don't advertise yourself by your comments, by your dress, or by your actions. You are at the beginning of a man's life. Queen's will initiate you in a man's fashion. Remember, Queen's men are doormen. They are quarried in the limestone city. <laughs> One gets the sense that Keith, even when trying to butch it up, fell short of the Queen's ideal of limestone masculinity. I really am a manly little chap, although I only weigh 122 pounds, Keith told reporters. I love wrestling, but I'm not, too, I'm not heavy enough to get on the hockey or football teams at Queen's. Still, as his student record reveals, Keith successfully completed the required physical training course, one of the few he managed to pass. Any deviation from proper sartorial codes or bodily comportment could land you uh, in front of the concursus. In 1921, one student was charged with, and I'm quoting now from the, from the minutes, wearing too brilliant a tie. In January of 1932, a student by the name of Bowman was charged with wearing an offensive garment, namely an unsightly pink shirt. In 1926, another was charged with wearing spats. This accessory for your shoes, usually made of leather or linen, depending on the season, was popular among Ivy League college men. But the sartorial sophistication of Harvard Yard was too showy for Kingston's modest Presbyterian school. One student found himself before the concursus for wearing spats on Princess Street. We can only guess at what the concursus would have thought about Keith's high heels and fox fur coat. In addition to clothing, physical appearance um, was also closely monitored. Unsightly hair seems to have been particularly offensive. The concursus rebuked one student for going three days without shaving. While in 1931, another was charged with being inadequately clothed in the common room of the union. A witness testified to having seen the student with his pants in his hands exposing a pair of hairy legs. He had been accosted by four other students who admitted to removing his clothing which they did in retaliation for the fact that he pulls hair, tickles ears, and generally disturbs bridge games, to say nothing of the fact that he's a kibitzer. 
a further case moves us a little bit closer to the queer suspicions that hovered over our Keith, um, at least for the tabloids. In late November of 1931, four months before Keith made his fateful foray into fairyland, a student by the name of Frank was charged with sleeping with a McMaster student male with the sole reason to delinquency. The offense occurred at 4.30 a.m. It's unclear how the witness in this case observed this intercollegiate intercourse, but the evidence inter entered into court was damning. Here's how the concursus minutes describe it. One jar of Vaseline, white, and a steel shoehorn. Don't ask me. <laughs> the court clerk's notes are interesting in this case. He said, use discretion in submitting this case. It would appear that the concursus did not proceed with Frank's case. While most of the indictment forms indicate the charge, the trial, and the outcome, Frank's indictment stated, Frank B. sleeping with a male McMaster student, but is otherwise left blank. And my guess is that, you know, I don't think it's uh, hard to figure out that this was done in order to prevent the unseemly details of sexual nonconformity at Queens from becoming public knowledge. Uh, cases from the concursus were regularly covered um, in the journal. What about same-sex activity and women? Women were regulated by the Levana Society, which operated its own court in cases of improper behavior by lady students. And going through the minutes of the Levana court, I think would make a really great project for any of the students out there who are looking for, um, for a project. I think it would, it would be, um, it'd be interesting. Certainly the tabloids were well aware of lesbianism. In the 1920s and 30s, Hush had an elaborate lesbian lexicon. Votaries at the shrine of Lesbia, daughters of Lesbia, man women, hell witches. If there was any doubt about the meaning of these terms, Hush spelled it out. A certain class of perverted women who fall in love with other women. So far in my research, I haven't found any daughters of Lesbia, specifically from Queens. But this doesn't mean that there weren't some likely candidates. Many of you um, likely know this woman. Yes? Charlotte Witten was a social worker, a feminist, and the first woman to become mayor of a major Canadian city, that city being Ottawa. Uh, Witten attended Queens from 1913 to 1917, and when she died in 1975, she instructed that her papers related to Queens be deposited at the Queens uh, University Archives. While at Queens, Witten became close with a number of women from the Levana Society. During her student days, she appears to have been closest to Esther Harrop and Maura, or Mo Guthrie, both of whom sent her passionate letters. Mo, to whom Witten gave a string of pearls, wrote, of missing those strong arms about me which used to make me feel so safe and secure. While Esther declared, the love of you fills me with a sense of pride, and by night, by day, I would claim you as my rightful possession. At least some of the Levana sisters considered these friendships mm, a little bit suspect. Mabel Powell remembered Witten being very friendly with one girl. Mabel Roberts, they're both named Mabel, sorry. Mabel Roberts and Witten were such close friends that Witten was in Mabel's room every day and would often lie down in her bed. Mabel saw nothing wrong with their friendship, but her friend Ethel disagreed and advised Mabel not to be so mixed up with Charlotte. The year after Witten graduated, she met Margaret Greer, um, who would become her life partner for the next 30 years. And I note that none of this that I've just uh, described for you um, about Witten is included in her entry on the Queen's uh, Encyclopedia. In 1928, Witten became the first uh, woman member of the Queen's Board of Trustees, and she was among those critical uh, during the 1930s of McNeil's policy of retrenchment. She was the only woman among 17 men on the committee to pick Principal Feist's successor. Correspondence between the men reveals that some of them regarded Witten as peculiarly poisonous. They might as well have called her a hell witch. It is also true that like other white first wave feminists, Witten's race politics uh, leave something to be desired. Her support during the Second World War of Canada's none is too many policy when it came to Jewish immigration made people think twice 
in 2011 when some wanted to name the Ottawa Municipal Archives in Witten's honour. Sometimes intimate relationships could be a refuge from forms of oppression based on culture and religion. As one of the few Jewish students at Queen's in the late 1930s, Lillian Coplin was ostracized by many of her peers, but she formed what she described in her oral history, and this is just one of many such oral histories of Queen's women in the archives. Um, she describes in her oral history an extremely close friendship with another female student. Lillian was very upset a few years later when I heard that it was rumored we were lesbians. It was something that had never occurred to me, despite the fact that these two women would routinely fall into each other's arms by way of greeting and walk along hand in hand. And these kind of behaviors, um, of course, it fit with like an earlier era of romantic friendships between uh, women as socially acceptable, but which by the time that we're looking at here, the mid uh, 20th century, um, become increasingly suspect with the public identification of lesbianism, thanks in, in part to things like the tabloids, right, doing the, the, the kind of stuff that um, they were up to. So we've got romantic physical relationships between women. We've got male students sleeping with each other. These were not the only forms of sexual dissidents at Queens. And here I'm drawing on the work um, of a former student, Renata Caldwell, who wrote um, a terrific undergrad thesis on the history of dating and courtship at Queens in the early 20th century. And she got it published on this um, popular peer-reviewed um, blog on the history of sexuality. Caldwell argues that university regulations um, and student dating rituals combined to produce a thoroughly heteronormative culture on campus. The bounds were drawn so tight that even students engaged in heterosexual forms um, of behavior could easily find themselves in the wrong. In 1930, for instance, a tabloid reported on two male students who disgraced Queen's University, having been caught up in a common body house in Toronto with two women in an orgy of whiskey and champagne. Even the tabloid disapprovingly, disapprovingly um, noted the gendered double standard in which the two women were found guilty of keeping a house of Ill, sh Ill fame, while the men went free with smiles of triumph on their faces to mingle again with their fellow students at Queen's University. Another context in which to understand Keith's story um, concerns the debate over coeducation, which reached one of its periodic peaks uh, in the early 1930s. In mid-April of 1932, just a couple of weeks after Keith's appearance in police court, uh, Principal Fife told the press that he was inclined to agree with the opinion that women were a sort of nuisance around the university. Now, Fife reassured people that Queens had no plans to erect any barriers to co-education, although we should remember that during these years of deepening economic depression, young men without work were encouraged to go to university, while um, young women were uh, made to stay home and help out uh, at home. Fife had to admit that some of the best students at Queen's were co-eds. However, he wished that they did not have such a fatal attraction to the men's students. When students leave the classroom following a lecture, instead of discussing some of the points in the lecture they've just heard, they promptly pair off and either discuss the highlights of the party they were attending last night or making dates for future meetings. Now, if Fife was ambivalent about women's students, his vice principal, Bean Counter McNeil, was downright reactionary. In March of 1932, uh, McNeil addressed the annual dinner of the COTC, the Canadian Officer Training Corps, um, a military organization on Canadian university campuses in the early to mid 20th century. The Queen's COTC um, practiced military drills, right, and they had like, you know, they had uh, simulated battles um, on, uh, on campus. McNeil told his audience, every time I see the COTC, I am thankful for the touch of masculinity that they give to this woman-infested place. <laughs> I am not a believer in co-education. The, the COTC is the masculine element at Queen's, and I hope that the members of it will prevail until all of the women are out of this institution. McNeil's remarks, reported in the Queen's Journal, caused an uproar. One male student wrote into the paper, those of us who do not belong to the COTC have been estimated by Dr. McNeil as so many pansies. The women students as though they were vermin. A woman student wrote into the paper, might I, as one of those who infest this college, point out that most men enter college at an age too late to make a man out of a sissy or a sissy 
out of a roughneck. The following week, the letters kept coming. Another male student claimed that most boys want to be soldiers, but, and I'm quoting, as we grow older, we find an outlet for this laudable impulse in organized sport of some kind, and we show our masculinity by mixing it freely with others similarly minded, not in fighting sham battles with an imaginary enemy. He signed his letter, Pansy Thug. <laughs> I want the t-shirt. <laughs> now, just how closely the students' use of terms pansy and sissy um, you know, uh, related to or mirrored the meanings of those terms in the tabloid press is difficult to determine. Uh, when asked by the papers about cross-dressing Keith, Principal Fife quipped, that's carrying co-education too far, betraying anxiety, I think, about the, uh, the ways in which co-education might somehow lead to a dangerous crossing or confusing um, of genders. So what happened to Keith after his adventure in Fairyland? If we return to um, his uh, his student record, it would seem that the sciences didn't really suit him either. He failed biology, chemistry, and physics, and in the exam's results column, we find not failing marks, uh, nor the register's notation D and W, but rather required to withdraw. This is confirmed in the, meeting, in the minutes of the uh, Faculty of Medicine, which on March 21st, 1932, after more than a month and a half of sustained media attention on Keith's escapades, noted next to his name, to withdraw. Now there's every reason to believe, right, given Keith's track record, that Keith would have lost his second year just as he did his first, even if he hadn't made that fateful trip to Toronto. At the same time, it's hard to imagine that the publicity over Keith's parading around as a pansy didn't have something to do with his departure from Queens. Now I hesitate to hold up as a historical role model, someone who flunked out twice, but I think there are actually some lessons in Keith's story for us. Once released from court on April Fool's Day, 1932, Keith beat a quick retreat to Union Station to catch a train back to Kingston, but not before entering, or so not before entertaining the paparazzi who had followed him there. Keith had some harsh words for his university. As he told the assembled crowd, at Queens, they do not encourage dramatic or artistic ability in the true sense. Everything there is so material. Graduates are churned out at Queens just like sausages through a machine. I'm sure I'm not the only one who hears an echo of this in today's university. Post-secondary education is thoroughly reduced to the material as students are regarded as customers buying a commodity and the value of degrees is measured by their worth on the market um, or the amount of tuition that they can generate. Chronic underfunding of post-secondary education means cutbacks, and we all know the first programs on the chopping block, languages, fine arts, archives programs, library assistants, those that can't prove their uh, worth immediately uh, in monetary terms. And so I hear in Keith's spirited defense of drama, music, and all things artistic, a rallying cry for our own day. We hear a lot at present um, in, you know, our, in our own uh, moment of austerity to remain focused on Queen's core educational mission and values. Let us then heed Keith's admonition, and all of us, professors, archivists, librarians, staff, students, and yes, administrators, and recommit ourselves in real ways to the university's core mission so that we might be turned out of Queen's as something more than just sausages through a machine. When it comes to gender and sexuality, there can be no doubt there has been much change, much progress since 1932. We are no longer debating the merits of co-education in the late 1980s and into the 90s. We were more likely to be talking about uh, sexual assault on campus, though it's not like that depressing reality has been resolved. In more recent years, spurred on by the trans movement, we've been talking about gender neutral washrooms, uh, about pronoun use, and now the backlash of spurious parental rights. But the most significant difference between then and now, of course, is the existence of movements, social movements, like feminism and the queer and trans movement, which can mobilize to respond to problems when they erupt. Keith had no movement to rely on, had he wanted one. There was no pride project at Queens, no Levanna Gender Advocacy Center, no human rights office, no yellow house. Where are my yellow house? 
But as Key's story demonstrates, in those pre-movement decades, there were other, more informal ways to resist sexual and gender conformity. One of them was a campy sense of occasion. Just before he boarded the train back to Kingston, Keith, with Union Station as his long wished for stage, and the newspaper reporters and the gathered crowd as his audience, struck a pose for a photographer. Here's how the paper described Keith's farewell scene. He wore, no, he, he wore no hat, and his beautiful blonde curly hair was being blown about in the stiff breeze. Before posing for the photographer, he pulled a comb from his vest pocket and deftly fortified his unruly locks with a few artistic touches. What a beautiful boy he is, exclaimed an onlooker, as the cameraman made his final click. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, hopefully it's not so much good. Um, I, we have some time for some uh, questions from the audience. Uh, if anyone has any questions for Stephen. Actually, I'll start with one then, <laughs> since I was going to wait for a second. Um, so uh, I'm just uh, wondering, you were talking about uh, the challenges of uh, getting access to the student record, first of all, which of course is frustrating, but you know, you're know, you right. Uh, we, ha we have things that we have to do here at the archives. Um, but uh, were there other frustrations that you found uh, trying to piece uh, Keith's story together uh, throughout this, or things that you wish you uh, would have found that you didn't have access to? Mm. Um, I don't know. It's like I said, I, th this project has really been, it's not been like an intensive one in terms of like, you know, the way I, I, I hope I go about the rest of my, of my research. It's been more like, like, oh, look at this. I found this. And then, you know, six months later, oh, here's something over here. So it's been a little bit um, like that. But um, sure, it's true. There are like pieces of the story that, you know, I can't um, put my uh, finger on because the, the records aren't there. Um, a bit of Keith's voice, I think, I hope as you heard, comes through in some of these sources because he was um, interviewed. But I don't have sources um, from Keith, like a diary or you know letters that, that um, uh, would have been written in a different context than those um, tabloid uh, interviews. Um, so, so yes and no, uh, but I, it's. I haven't encountered restrictions. It's more, I don't know, maybe if I had sort of, if I, if I focus more on Keith as a project, I suspect some of those will, um, will come up. But right now, it's, I'm actually more surprised by, it's like, oh, next month something else turns up. So it's actually great. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, anything else? Yes, <laughs> um, I mean not not a, a lot, but uh, but a bit. Um, Keith, uh, he went on to get married and, and he had kids, um, and perhaps alarmingly, he also became a doctor. <laughs> 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 um, and uh, I, I, but not not from Queens. I th I think he probably went um, this part. I'm guessing to McGill uh, because he practices a doctor in Montreal, and that's where he dies. Um, but the, the bit is really quite short. So um, it's not providing like a lot of, you know, it wasn't like, a, oh, and here's this great person and here's their life story. Right? Just uh, his wife, his children, that he was a doctor um, is really what you get.
sort of so getting that sense of a record um, that that things just has there been anything else that sort of has just come to you as a story when you feel more concentrated um, look into record uh, that you've done? Um, I'm not sure if I would if I if, if I could put my finger on like particular um, sources or things that. Um, that I have found that, that I didn't share here. But I think you're, exa you're exactly right, though, about the, at least the way I've experienced it, right, that researching Keith has just been kind of a delight because it's, it's surreptitious. It's just, it, it's, it's exactly as you say. It's like, I look at this one, and then six months later, I, I'll, I'll go this way, and I'll, you know, it's, it, it's, it's nice to do a project that actually isn't tied to, um, you know, an article or, or something, like that because uh, it, fr it, it frees me up, anyway, to, um, to, to, to sit with archives and with sources and figure out where they might um, take me next. Yeah. That was a wonderful explanation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, yes. Sure. Hi. That's a good. That's a good question. Um, I don't know. I mean, perhaps yes. If we think about like what Keith was saying, right? That I mean, he he, when he takes his trip to Toronto, um, he is in med school. He's been in med school for a year. But everything Keith talks about is about art, about music, about literature, and uh, and there are other quotes from him where he kind of just goes on about like his favorite authors and favorite pieces of music, and um, he doesn't ever mention like science med school um, so I, I think yeah he he found a place um, for himself there yeah yes Um, I guess there, um, you're talking about just those police court records, I'm thinking about most of my own research, non-Keith's related research, has been in criminal court records uh, from all levels of courts um, looking at same-sex offenses. So my comments about police court records are just specific to the fact that that lower court record, which is like, you know, it's a bit of a problem because that's actually where most people encountered the, the law. Those records have been lost or destroyed um, because, not, not, I don't mean here at Queen's, I, just, I mean across, uh, Ontario is what I know the best, Ontario archives, um, because those records often weren't regarded as, as important. They were kind of just run of the mill, right? But like higher court records are well kept. And, you know, and they can also be revealing in, in lots of ways. So, when I, so the comparison I'm just making there is between um, lower court records and, and, and higher middle court records for which we have like, um, greater numbers. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so then when I think about police court records that I've seen in other places in Ontario, right, and then at the Archives of Ontario they have police court, some police court records for lots of different jurisdictions, they are, it's like they're really, really scant, really short. Um, so I was just, I, I guess I was plugging the, the police court records here because of the efforts of, 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 of Heather gathering those together, we have a really great um, uninterrupted run, right? It's not like massive, but again, compared to most police court records, it's it's that it's actually quite wonderful. Yeah. Uh, Um, yes, uh, in Kingston I'm not so sure, in terms of the records, 
Um, but in the work that I've done that focuses mainly on Toronto and other larger urban centers, yeah, absolutely, right? That, that part of what one uses those court records for of same-sex offenses is to track um, recurring places, right? Where, where, in the case of my, my research, where men met, right? So parks and laneways, back alleys, um, lavatories, places like that. And, you know, and, and I know from, uh, I've learned from your research, right, that you've done some of this um, for Kingston for, for a slightly later period in which space, right, like the baseball field for lesbians or um, city park for, for gay men, um, those kinds of spaces become um, sexualized or, or, or related to, um, to emerging sexual subcultures in, you know, not just Toronto, but also in places like Kingston. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm always fascinated by the the question of sex and space. Oh, oh, sorry, I thought you raised your hand. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I feel like I've been taught thirty years ago, so I'm happy. <laughs> 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 um, Who let her in? <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think you're, you're onto something there because, I mean, I guess the way I see it in this particular story is that, um, you know, I didn't, uh, I, I cut a lot, of, a lot of stuff out, so I didn't, I didn't have time to, to talk about the, the tabloids, for instance, right? They were a particular kind of uh, journalistic genre, right? They were generally in this period sort of populist in their, in their political orientation. And so one of the things that they um, loved to do was to poke at elites. And so there's a reason, right, that they are um, after Keith. Um, they're sort of tolerant in some ways, but, but if you think about it in relationship to the, 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 the hushes or the tabloids larger political project, they are looking at universities, at privileged university students, particularly these men, and saying, you know, either sometimes explicitly or between the lines, what is it with these people that they get to go running around parading like uh, as a pansy when, you know, the rest of us are trying to figure out how to put food on the table? Um, there is a real, um, an interesting kind of politics at, at work there. So I don't know if that actually answers your question, but, it, but, it, but, but in my mind, yes, it, it seems like that they, they fully understand university students as um, something unto themselves, and it's, it's, from their point of view, not always a good thing, right? This is why, like, the Globe and Mail and, the, and, you know, the Toronto Star were just like, oh, you know, silly university boys, and it's the tabloid that's like, this actually doesn't look so good on you, Queens. Okay. Uh, maybe we'll take one more question. Yeah. I'm going to see you on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> I have a really smart bunch of archive um, students this, this term. Um, I, think, I think we see it in lots of different ways. I, partly, I, I guess, the, the, you know, the couple of examples that I gave, the way in which the archives, you know, it's not just like this sort of fortress. Like, researchers come in, they're open to, um, to us being there, and sometimes even saying, hey, like, would you want to help us, like, you know, find out where this thing is and help us get it? And, or in, I think really in the case of the LGBTQ collection, right? That, that, there, th that is um, not about Queens, that is about Kingston. But the Queens Archives has made a real effort to provide a home for it. 
right? Because it's it. Where else do we do you keep that stuff, right? In a in a small-ish sized place like Kingston, we don't have a community, a queer community archive outside the university. So, so I see those those boundaries as quite malleable um, here, and that is not the case in lots of other institutions, right? Particularly like bigger ones or uh, more state archives. You know, we we, we know this. We, yeah. I'm just going to steal the microphone oh, for a second just course. so I can, so that way it's recorded. But um, So uh, before I uh, offer thanks, uh, I, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Jeremy Heil. I'm the acting uh, university archivist and associate university librarian. Uh, normally you'd see Ken Herndon up here, but uh, he's back there somewhere <laughs> taking a bit of a break. Uh, you'll see him next year, don't worry. Um, so uh, it is my distinct pleasure to, uh, to thank Stephen for uh, his incredible talk. Uh, like, I was on the edge of my seat. I'm like, what's going to happen next? Like, seriously, it was, it was everywhere, and it touched on everything, did it not? Like, uh, I, I would, I've never seen, uh, I think, our archives so well represented uh, in a talk before of uh, both community archives, of uh, some of the published record, of, uh, I mean, I know Deirdre would be very keen on all of the university uh, uh, call out there. And just uh, how uh, how incredible that social history sort of came together, um, I was uh, I was really uh, really floored by that. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I know uh, as an archivist, it's our job to acquire and preserve the records of the university, the community, and beyond. Uh, but it's only through researchers like Stephen that uh, stories found in these records see new light, and uh, patterns found in disparate pieces of information scattered throughout the archival holdings. Uh, the archives lecture really is an opportunity uh, to see how primary sources are synthesized to gain a better understanding of our past and hopefully inform us better of our present and future and uh, this year's uh, lecture so eloquently did this. So um, I, I wish to say that since these primary sources have proven so important to future research, I'm also very pleased to announce that Stephen will be donating his uh, personal papers to Queen's Archives. So uh, from what I understand, uh, these papers are going to cover a wide range of his activist involvements, including the successful movement from, to divest Queens from companies doing business in apartheid South Africa, to the very first Kingston Pride Weeks, and early organizing in response to HIV AIDS crisis. Uh, Stephen's records will become part of the QUA's uh, Kingston LGBTQ2 Plus collection, which since its inception in 2011 has proven up to be a vital record of Kingston's rich and diverse heritage. So before closing, uh, I would like to offer my sincere gratitude to the following people. Uh, first to uh, Heather Holm, who kicked us off, um, who uh, has been doing, uh, I guess, spearheading the archives lecture since uh, we both first started in pretty much 2001. And I can't imagine these uh, events running uh, half as well as they do without her. Uh, and in fact, a couple of times she's been on sabbatical, I think there. Yeah. We, we pulled our own, but it was OK. <laughs> <laughs> Not allowed to take sabbatical. <laughs> Uh, I also wish to uh, thank uh, Lisa Gervais, uh, Nancy Petrie, Natasha Watt, and Sean Baddeley for their incredible help in arranging this event and setting up the room and everything. Uh, to uh, university librarian Mark Asberg for his and the library's continuing support of uh, the annual archives, uh, this annual archives tradition. Uh, and uh, to Baldwin's as well for recording. Uh, so uh, if your friends were not able to make it today, Please tell them that this will be online. Uh, we will be posting it to the uh, Queen's University Library uh, YouTube site. Uh, or, you know, for any of you who uh, wish to see uh, an amazing talk yet again uh, in the future, please feel free to take a look. Uh, it will be up imminently. Uh, and finally, thank you to every single one of you for attending uh, this year's lecture. Uh, we welcome you to stick around. Uh, please have a chat, uh, ask Stephen some more questions, and there's plenty of refreshments in the back, uh, coffee, tea, water, and various other goodies too. So please help yourselves and thank you once again for attending this year's lecture. <laughs>